each and every one of you this afternoon. And I'm going to take you to um, a, a, another portion of scripture that is a parallel portion for the passage that Wade had already read. So we're not going to completely repeat it. We'll return to it in a moment. But turn to with me for a very brief reading in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. This is the parallel passage that Matthew is recorded. You're going to get some information from Mark's Gospel that was not in Matthew's Gospel. So it says in verses 20, uh, 33 that what, then he came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12 and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, then he shall be last of all and the servant of all. And he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he'd taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's just further look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God above, but you are the God of this earth. And we have proclaimed by our lips and by our actions being here today that you are the Lord of our hearts. So too were the disciples. They, uh, all of them, had professed to be followers of you. And so, like these disciples of old, we pray that you will teach us more of what it means to be a follower, to be great in your kingdom, and to be uh, learning much more about what it means to care for others who are weaker. Again, we thank you for this time and we give you our thanks in Jesus' name, amen. So this is a parallel passage as we said earlier and um, in Matthew chapter 18, we don't find out that they were actually back in Capernaum or back in the house. So unless you watch into Mark's gospel chapter nine, you would still think that they were walking on the road. Such was not the case. They had been walking on the road, and all that long journeying back, there was a big argument going on. Now, this is a guy thing, so for the gals that are amongst us today, you can sit back and just say, see, I told you so. <laughs> because guys are always uh, in a pecking order. It doesn't matter whether you're in a church, it doesn't matter whether you're in a group of guys who are just hanging out, there's always this Who's going to be number one? It's part of the way God made us as, as males. It's part of the divine command. He said to Adam, you will do these things. You will rule over the, the world. You will name the animals. You will do these things. And so it's part of who we are as beings created by God. It's part of being very distinct from a female. And in fact, that's one of the things the Bible makes very clear. Every one of our so-called trillion cells, now I haven't counted them off, so if you disagree with me, you just have, get out your counter and start working on it. But according to the scientists, we all have about a trillion cells, and each one of those cells that comes in my body is genetically male. From the bone cell, to the skin cell, to the toenail cell. And the same is true for female. He made them male and female. And these males were doing what males do. And that's just kind of duking it out amongst themselves in a little sparring match. You can imagine what was going on. First of all, there's Peter, James, and John. They'd been up on the mountain. And they were going, I'm sure they were going, well, look at here, guys. Uh, listen, we're getting pretty close to Jerusalem. We're just about ready to see the overturn of Rome. Now, they were thinking politics. Let's face it. They were having a political discussion and a radical revolutionary discussion. They were thinking about how are we going to get enough arms to overthrow Rome? Well, we shouldn't have to worry about that because Jesus, he can overthrow a storm. He can overthrow death itself. We've seen that. So I guess we don't really, really worry about arms. But nevertheless, how is this going to take place? And who's going to be top dog? I remember that statement. I am the greatest. 
spoken by none other than Cassius Clay, who later named himself Muhammad Ali. And I remember him going out there and saying, you can't beat me. And he would jump up and down and he'd prance around and it was a lot of showmanship going on, but he really knew how to sell what he was doing as a boxer. But I also remember the last time I see, saw Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay, and it was at the Olympics. And frail as he was with, I believe it was Parkinson's disease, he was reaching up very gingerly to light a arrow that was going to be sent across and ignite the Olympic flame. Were you there at that moment? Did you see that? I did. I remember that well. And I thought to myself, there's a man who said, I am the greatest. And look at him now. And that's a statement of every man. Because at one point, especially when you're around 30, you feel invincible. You feel like the world can't do anything to you. You can just walk over everybody. These men, these disciples were getting that, that feeling. They were saying, man, I can do it. We can do this thing. We have the Messiah. John, Jesus had asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter piped up, you are the Messiah, God's son, the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what? He said, you're right. He had told them, Simon, Peter, you didn't catch that from your own noggin. God revealed that to you. My father in heaven has shown that to you. And so they said, we're on the right track. We are the people that have, wow, we are the chosen generation to enjoy Messiah. And all that means. Now, they were thinking of a thousand years of reign. They were thinking of a millennial kingdom. They were thinking of throwing up the Romans and having the restoration of pure temple worship, not worshiping the temple, but worshiping God through the temple. And they were not thinking of the cross at all. That was the furthest thing from their thinking. And so it was that Jesus, it says, he, uh, the scripture says, calls a child. Now, actually, Mark's account makes it very clear. He does more than call a child. He brings a child in. So consider for a moment the scene. The guys have been discussing among themselves, and Jesus just lets them kind of talk. I'm glad he does that. I'm so quick. Maybe you're like me that way. You hear something wrong, and you want to correct it right away. You hear somebody that says something that you don't agree with, and you've got to get in there and bang. You gotta say something. And we were commenting on the way down how Jesus is not only the perfect gentleman, but the perfect servant. He spoke and the worlds came into being. He created this world by the word of his might. And yet there were railers, there were scoffers, there were deriders all through his experience. And he oftentimes didn't say a thing. Boy, that's not like me, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm so quick to respond and I'll pop off here and I'll pop off there. You're not like that, I'm sure, but I'm like that. And these men were like that and they were talking among themselves. They were arguing. They were even maybe getting ready to give a duke it out amongst themselves. Peter could say, but wait a minute, I was the one that first confessed and I went up to the mountain and he told me, I have the keys of the kingdom. And the other two, James and John said, and yes, and we were right beside you, and we can say that's true. And and we've, we've seen the glory. We, well, no, we're not supposed to say anything about Moses and Elijah. So they couldn't say anything about that. There you go. Uh, uh, but we saw something. <laughs> we saw something. And, and, and we we're, we're, we're really right up there. And they're getting angry with one another. And then it says, Jesus takes a little child. He walks over, brings the little child by the hand and walks right in the midst of those 12 and sets the child in the middle of them. They look, uh-oh, something's happening. Then he takes the little child up in his arms and he looks at them. You can just see him turning around. Little child, 
That little child is just in his glory. He's in the arms of God. Deuteronomy, uh, I think it's 33. Let me just see if I got the right quotation because I, I, I do want to get the right quotation. Uh, Deuteronomy, yeah, 33. Uh, I'm going to find it here. It's going to show up. Anyways, underneath are the everlasting arms is the verse I was looking for. It's in Deuteronomy 32 or 33. I'll, I'll look it up and get you that afterwards. But the point is this. That little child was in the arms of God. And I'll tell you something. We have all know what it's been like to be comforted by the arms of God. During great times of grieving, great times of suffering, great times of trauma, great times of sorrow, it's as if God gives you a hug. He says, I'm here. I have never left you. I love you. Don't worry. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. And he says this to this little child, I'm sure. And that child is just looking up with a big grin on his face. And he does. I don't think the child knew what was going on. Maybe he did. Some of the commentators think that this little child was actually... Um, I think it was one of the one of the special um, uh, special famous bishops of the early church by the name of Ignatius, but we're not so sure. We're, we're not sure. There's nothing to prove that. Oh, there's the verse I was looking for. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27: The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is meant to convince them who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who is the greatest? He says, assuredly, verse 3, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What? You can just see Peter looking, hey, he's calling me unconverted here. I just this testified to him that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Back in Matthew 16, I can think of Thomas saying, yeah, he knows my heart. Uh, yeah, I am unconverted. Judas definitely knew he was unconverted. John, he says he was unconverted because in John chapter 20, he says, then he believed after the resurrection. You see, there's one thing to be converted. It's another thing to say you are converted. I know that from personal experience. For almost seven years, I claimed to be a Christian, but it wasn't until I repented of my sin and won the victory, as that Victory in Jesus song says. And it's not that the song gives the basis for our theology, but rather, the theology comes from the word of God. And how do we know that? Because Jesus says so right here. Except you are converted. Now conversion is not like becoming a disciple. Anyone can come become a disciple, but be unconverted. Well, we know that because Judas wasn't one of the 12. But there's a difference between being converted and being a Christian and then being, saying you are converted. And so it was that the disciples heard something that was a hard saying because of all people, they thought of themselves as converted. I wish the entire church of Jesus Christ in the world would hear there is a difference between conversion and tradition, between conversion and family history, between conversion and religion. Did you know this is based on our interaction with some of the Indian Christians? That there are many Christians from the subcontinent of India and they are as unconverted as many of the North American so-called Christians because they have never been truly repentant of their sin. 
And they have never truly been born again. See, the Bible is clear. Jesus, over and over in his message, made it clear that conversion has many, many uh, facts, uh, many facets, like a diamond, actually. And one facet is you have a new birth. The old has passed, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. There's a time when you say, oh, I see it now. This is what I was. This is now who I am in Christ. Now, you may not have a timeline. I, 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 there's a lot of us that say, yeah, I know there was a, an old Dave and there's a new Dave. There's a, there was a time when I was outside of the family and there's a time that I'm now in the family. But some of us never put it down in our Bibles or never wrote it down. We're not used to marking things down like that. Others have a, an exact date, and they say, this is when I was born again. And they know it. But the point is, life is life. And if you have the life of Jesus, you have a new life in you. The disciples also needed to know that not, where the, not only were they needing to understand that there was a new life that was coming in, but they were now be going to become like children. Children are humble. Children are trusting. Children are accepting. Children are not racist. Have you ever noticed that? They never see the color of the skin of another child. Not until they're taught to see it. I've seen multiple times where children from all kinds of different ethnic backgrounds and they get together and they hang out and they're playing with their blocks and they're having fun together and they don't even know. This is Johnny. I don't know if he's black or brown or white or you know, whatever. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Children are accepting. And children not only accept, but they trust. They have that innate ability to realize, I can't do this thing called life, but I have parents that do it for me. We can't do the Christian life, but we have a heavenly father who can plan it all. We were thinking of that this week. A man's ways plans his steps. No, a man's ways plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Did you have a week that went exactly the way you expected it to? Anybody here? Anybody here sat down and said, Monday's going to be this way, Tuesday's going to be this way? Of course not. We, we're so used to that now, we just say, oh, that, that, it is what it is. That's the famous expression today. It is what it is. You know, this is just what happens. And this is how we cannot plan our way, but God can. The Father can. He can dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. And his Son has given us the greatest gift of all, eternal life through his substitutionary death and resurrection. Some people stop at the death. And they try to live the Christian life on their own steam or on their own power. You know what I say about steam? It's a fog. When my glasses steam up, I can't even see. You know, how many times I've been driving along in the middle of winter and I'd step out from a warm house and get into the car and the glasses would fog up and the first thing you do is you say, that's my own steam again. I can't use it. It's no good. All it's doing is clouding the issue. But the Lord can give clarity when we cannot. And so it says, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He then goes on from verses 6 through to verses um, 9 to talk about offenses. The word offenses is the Greek word scandalous. Scandalizo, actually, which means to stumble. I'll bet you remember this from the bullies of your school. You're running down the um, outside playground. You're just chasing a ball. You're minding your own business, but the schoolyard bully sticks the foot out and bam, you're down on your face in the mud puddle. And if you haven't had that happen, well, you'd be thankful because I think everybody had that happen for once or twice. Stumble is what he's just done. He's deliberately stumbled you. 
This is the passage which talks about stumbling, but not stumbling in small ways, but stumbling in big ways, stumbling the little children. What is the biggest stumbling block to little children today? Evolution. There is no God, atheism. That you're just a byproduct of chance. That there is no hope because it's all just a fluky accident, you know, from the, from the goo to the slew, you know, that's basically what the, the, the philosophy of this world teaches. And little children from the earliest of age are being taught that. They're being taught there is no God. They know there's a God because the world speaks volumes. That little dragonfly that just floated by, the ant that came up and looked at them in the eye, the flower that they examined and brought to you and said, here's a flower, mommy. All of these have spoken to them that God exists. Psalm 19 says, God shows his own glory by the handiwork, the stars. They magnify his glory. And then he goes on to say in Psalm 19, and the word magnifies his glory as well. We have denied two things to our little children. The greatest stumbling blocks of any generation has been there is no God and evolution and the word of God is withdrawn from the schools. The schools in our nation were in fact established by the early Christians. Schooling was a product of what we were taught in Deuteronomy chapter six when God said to the parents, you shall teach them when you walk by the way, when you sit down, when you go to bed, you teach them my ways. And schooling was part of that process, however, Schooling has been taken over by those who insist that God no longer exists. He's not welcomed here. Do you know where God is welcomed? In the prisons. You can still get a Bible in the prisons, thankfully. So what have we done? We've created a whole generation of stumbled children who believe that their greatest pursuit is the pursuit of happiness through drugs, Happiness through illicit sex, happiness through the pursuit of pleasure, and the happiness that is going to fade because happiness it depends on happenings. Whereas God's joy is independent of all. How can a person rejoice in the midst of great sorrow? There's only one way. The God of joy is your portion. And so these men were learning that children is foundational for the work of discipleship. You want to get the kingdom big? Start working with the children. Now, unfortunately, during these recent times, the children are the ones who are being penalized by our present and current restrictions. And yet, statistically, it does not make sense. Did you know, for example, 22,000 children were kept in daycare in the height of the New York pandemic when thousands upon thousands of people were dying daily and those children were, the care, were being give, given the right to be caregivers. Uh, they were given to, to, from the people that were in the healthcare profession. In other words, the healthcare profession would leave their children with these daycares and then go out and serve the fight against COVID. 22,000, not one incidence of transmission of COVID amongst the children. And we have a debate going on in our land that says somehow we should protect our children from COVID. And God is saying, They've got an innate ability to be protected from COVID. You don't need to worry about them. And not one transmission of COVID from the children to any of the healthcare workers. Now, there's a big debate going on today about should we restart the schools? I say yes, because the children are losing sight of who they are and their responsibilities, but they should bring back God the Bible and creation along with that. I'm not sure we're gonna see that yet, but who knows, God is a God of revival and we hope that will happen. 
And then he goes on to say, and if your right hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Literally, throw it away. Balo. That's from which we get the word ball, by the way. <laughs> Balo it away. <laughs> and basically he's saying, if you have something that's causing you to stumble, some of these children, get rid of it. Let it go. And then he goes on to say, take heed that you do not despise these little ones. I love verses 10 through 14 because he does two things. He first of all reminds the believers, the disciples, that these little ones are being protected by angels. He says, don't you, don't you forget that these little ones have angels who are looking straight into the eyes of God. And so those little children are being taken care of by their angels. So be careful. You do not want to stumble someone who's being taken care of. Otherwise, you might be fighting with God's mighty angels. And why you could say that? It's because in the Old Testament, many times, there were experiences where an angel brought about some very serious consequences. The first Passover, the angel of death went amongst them and every firstborn male in Egypt dies. An angel stood up for the nation of Israel when Sennacherib came in and that very night, 185,000, that's one angel. Jesus said he had 10,000 angels at his command. And so when we talk about speaking ill of God or speaking lightly about these frivolous, these things as frivolous, we must be careful because God says their angels are watching out for them. You better remember that. Secondly, he says this, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep? One of them goes astray. Does he not leave the 90 and nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? This is very, very strange math. Uh, it's not nor, it's not 21st century math. 21st century math would say, wait, hold on here. You're going to leave 90 and 9. That's 99, 99%. And you're going up to the mountains, putting your life at risk for 1%. Okay, here's the key. That 1% may be the next Billy Graham. That 1% might be the next uh, person, Hudson Taylor, China Inland Missions. That 1% might be the next Judson, Adoniah uh, Judson, I believe his name was, uh, another missionary. There are, if you look at the, at the stories of how these people come to faith in Christ, they don't come from great backgrounds, kind of like Gideon. Who am I, Lord? I'm the least of my father's family. I'm in down here in, you know, I'm down here in this, in this pit trying to do some things uh, to, to the wheat, but who am I? You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to rescue the whole nation. That's what he was told. These children, we've got to start praying for the children. When we're praying for the COVID, we need to be praying for the children. Secondly, he says, even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Do you know what that reminds me of? There is a promise there. He hasn't lost one yet. He never will. But there's a privilege that we have as his children and disciples in this day and age to reach out to the children and to go the way that he would have us go so that they would be one to Jesus. And there's the privilege of helping them come to faith in Christ and the reward that makes you great. Who would be the greatest? In Mark's account, he says, become the servant of all. Wow, that's not what anybody wanted to be hearing. And it's interesting that when it came to the Last Supper, when he describes what took, takes place in the accounts, it says that John records it, only John, by the way, it says Jesus laid aside his garments, he stoops, and he grabs that basin of water and he starts washing the disciples' feet. 
The greatest servant of all doesn't just preach it, he lives it. And he goes out there and does that for them. I suppose Peter, James, John, and the others, with the exception of Judas, slowly gathered that message and became servants. We know Thomas did, because Thomas, the greatest skeptic of all, went back to southern India. We made mention of India earlier. And that land was evangelized by Thomas in southern India. And many of the people became devout followers of Jesus because of that skeptic. 200 years after the skeptic who became a missionary to India, there was another skeptic. His name was Ravi Zacharias. I think I mentioned him here before. And he became a Christian at the age of 17 in the exact same town where Thomas was martyred for the love of God, for Jesus Christ. And so this, there's a circular sense of how things run. And I believe that's what God loves to do. And he says, oh, you people who are Marxists and Leninists and said that God is dead and you believe that this is the thing and that God will never rise up, guess what I'm going to do? And a few years later, the very place where that was proclaimed becomes the central head office of a Bible society in Europe. Because God says, "Uh uh-uh, no, no, I'm not dead. I may be silent a lot of the times, but I'm not dead. And so this afternoon, what are we doing for the kingdom? Are we praying? Are we loving as he called us to love? And are we reaching out to the children? Well, it's rather interesting. It was the children that heralded the Lord Jesus on that very exciting day when he came in on the foal of a donkey. And they said, blessed is he who came in. He is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. And the leaders said, shut up the children. Why was it that the children were doing this? Because they were following Jesus. We need to bring children to faith in Christ. I know there's no children here today, but maybe we're maybe we're looking at revival from the wrong point of view. Maybe we should be going after the children to bring them to faith in Christ, and that's where the revival will will actually start.